Here is today's agenda. Our featured guests are Craig Clapper, founding partner of Healthcare Performance Improvement and a partner in Press Ganey Transformational Advisory Services. And Kathleen Goonan, founder Goonan Performance Strategies and now a partner with GuideHouse. At the completion of their presentations, we will have questions from the audience that will be moderated by myself and Ben Sawyer, the president and CEO of SOAR Vision Group. We will then have a foundation update, an update from the Baldrige Program, the Alliance for Performance Excellence, and a few closing remarks. Now it is a privilege to introduce Craig and Kate. Craig Clapper is a founding partner of Healthcare Performance Improvement and a partner in Press Guinea Transformational Advisory Services. Craig has more than 30 years experience improving reliability in nuclear power, transportation, manufacturing, and the healthcare industries. Kate Goonan founded Goonan Performance Strategies and is now a partner with GuideHouse. Kate is a physician executive with more than 30 years experience coaching executive teams on transformational strategy and the effective use of Baldrige. Craig, I'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Al, and, and thanks for having me today. As Al had mentioned, uh, my group, Healthcare Performance Improvement, is part of the Press Ganey family. Most of us know uh, Press Ganey through our work in healthcare and measuring uh, quality through the uh, patient and family's viewpoint, and then using that to in improve care. Next slide, please. Is uh, HPI is part of uh, Press Ganey, and we're the safety and reliability solution within Press Ganey Consulting. And our group is uh, relatively small. There's only 30 of us. Half of us are from high reliability industries like aviation, manufacturing, and I'm from nuclear power. And our client community, um, a, a sizable segment, we have about 1,400 hospitals worth of integrated systems, and then we have 119 system clients. Thanks, Al. Next slide. I'd like to distinguish uh, right away between two uh, expressions, which I think are used somewhat interchangeably and should not be considered interchangeable. So whenever we say high reliability, I want you to think that the healthcare delivery system is just very reliable. It's, it's good at giving appropriate care to every patient every time. But when we talk about HRO or high reliability organizations, then that's a more specific uh, set of uh, knowledge that involves what are called super traits of high reliability organizations, the way they make their socio-technical system reliable. So in, in a way, high reliability, just a broad category, but then HRO is a specific body of knowledge. Next slide, please. If we look across the top, uh, high reliability organizing was studied in uh, three industries, carrier aviation, uh, commercial aviation, and then nuclear power. Most of us know about this work through the bestseller, Managing the Unexpected, which is shown in the middle of the slide by Carl Weick and Kathleen Sutcliffe. In fact, their work is so popular and well-known, uh, many people think that the five principles of high reliability organizations from Weick and Sutcliffe are the only principles. I would point out that there are several thought leaders, and, and you could make a case to say that the Weick and Sutcliffe five are, are the most important. In fact, uh, next slide, on, on the following page, I wanted you to have this as resource. So maybe your note here would be just get a, get a hard copy of slide eight you know, from our friends. And every name that we see on the slide is a thought leader in either safety, high reliability organizing, or the newer part, resilience engineering. And every leader here had either five, seven, or nine things that they thought that we should do. Oddly, none of them had six or eight things. There was always five, seven, or nine. So if you look in the left center, Carlene Roberts, a university professor in, at Berkeley, she dispatched Todd Laporte, Gene Rockland, and Tim Vogus out to look at those high reliability industries and determine what made them different. And that was really the beginning of, of this kind of knowledge. One of her students was Carl Weick, 
and he went on to University of Michigan. So you have the Berkeley School and then the Michigan School. And then Carl Weick with Kathleen Sutcliffe wrote that very good book, Managing the Unexpected. In general, the trajectory of, of healthcare has been to start up in safety culture and then dip down into high reliability organizing over time and then add in what's called resilience engineering. Uh, next slide, please. So on, on this slide, we get to see uh, a sampling of that thought leadership. In fact, the only one that you see in total are the five from Wyke and Sutcliffe, deference to expertise at the top, reluctance to simplify interpretations a little lower, commitment to resilience in the middle, sensitivity to operations near the bottom, preoccupation with failure at the very bottom. Now, now, my thought is that we're stuck in the era of descriptive theory, where you go to any conference and you listen to several presentations where they just rehash the descriptive theory. I think what we want out of today's dialogue is how to convert that descriptive theory into actual practice. And I think Kate, Kate will lend uh, her experience and wisdom and how to do that through one construct, and I hope to add a little bit through this construct. But the idea on this example di driver diagram, if you take something you want like deference to expertise and you convert that into daily activities like through those universal skills that are shown at the top, like maybe as few as five or six practices that everybody has. And as you practice those things, you become more and more like a high reliability organization. And then the same is true for, for leadership that would be bundled into uh, probably like a high reliability organizing leadership system or a leadership operating system in general. Next slide, please. So on, on this figure, that blue line is a maturation curve where people practice those habits. And as they practice those habits over time and they reach 100% shown up at the top, 100% in habit formation would mean everybody's practicing that habit every time it's indicated. Well, as leaders, caregivers, providers, support team, as they practice those habits, the good things reach up with it, like the quality of care, patient experience, engagement of caregivers and providers, efficiency. And then the bad things, the defects, like patient harm and workforce injury tend to go to zero. So I think that's another thing to listen for today is that it's not so much the idea or training on the idea, it's practicing the idea. That if we put the idea into action and we practice it as a habit, then we can get those good outcomes. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Craig. Now we'll hear from Kate Goonan. Kate? Thank you, Al, and it's great to get to spend this time with Craig as well. I've been a long-term admirer from a distance, so it's a delight to be here. Uh, I just want to give you a quick thumbnail of what GuideHouse is. Um, it's a advisory services firm that actually originated as the PwC public sector organization and very proudly won the Baldrige National Quality Award in 2014. It was purchased uh, in 2018 by Capital uh, Vin, uh, Veritas Capital, and it uh, merged with Navigant Consulting in uh, last fall, which is how we came to be the large organization, large organization. Guidehouse. I only uh, point this out because we are, in fact, a, a deeply committed Baldridge user, very proud of our shared values, as all of you who are are familiar with Baldridge, very values-driven organization. In the middle there, you see our very proud um, commitments to our culture and, and culture of inclusion and diversity. Uh, and then we, uh, up in the up right corner, we, like all Baldridge users, um, make a, a significant investment in how we support our local uh, communities where we work. So, and we are a global company. The next slide um, actually says a little bit about what we do. Uh, in these six boxes, describes at a very high level what our activities are. What I would point out to you is as an advisory firm, what we've worked hard now for many years to do in my work prior at GPS and then Navigant now with GuideHouse, 
is to incorporate the Baldrige body of knowledge into consulting solutions that allow us to use the framework whether and the the framework as a diagnostic tool and as a scaffolding against which you incorporate all your tactics and solutions and approaches whether an organization is pursuing the award or simply trying to solve a problem we work hard to ensure we're leveraging the Baldridge body of knowledge to build them a strong culture and strong capabilities next slide well, for any of you who've ever worked with a consultant, it kind of works like this. Uh, in traditional consulting environments, uh, the performance of the organization, whether it's financial or safety or whatever, uh, goes awry and the CEO hires consultants, the consultant leaves and, and the performance drops, and then you hire a new consultant and you run in the cycles of performance up and down, which really don't solve the problems. Next slide shows also what people are facing in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, we're seeing a myriad of expectations that need to be addressed, right? It's, we're all probably, some of the people who registered for today are off at coronavirus preparation meetings. Um, many, many organizations that we work with are, are at various stages of what Craig described in terms of high reliability or HRO organizations. But of course, you've got these other things as well, including what, you know, CEOs and CFOs take very seriously, appropriately so, is making a financial margin so that we can finance the innovation that we need to do to deliver better quality. And the next slide really shows uh, that what we see happening when organizations adopt the Baldrige framework in terms of their overall cost structure, but you could put any other uh, outcome measure into this way of thinking. When organizations begin to use the framework as a systems view of the enterprise, and they, be, they adopt the approach of taking a systems view of everything that they do, whether it's from safety to making a financial margin, they gradually, in fact, are able to improve their performance, reduce their cost in the case of this picture. But what we, we aspire to do by leveraging the Baldrige body of knowledge is to ensure those improvements are sustainable and they've built capabilities that they can use on their own over time. And the next slide just highlights, for many of you, I'm guessing you have some background with Baldridge. This is the Baldridge framework. So what does this really mean in terms of what an organization is doing when they leverage the Baldridge framework? You know, Baldridge is questions, it's not answers. I would say that's one of the most important fundamental differences between high reliability science and Baldridge. The questions are organized in a way that's based on management science, but they're non-prescriptive. So they don't say you should defer to expertise as one of your behavioral expectations, for example. HRO organizations adopt that principle and build that into their behavioral expectations. But Baldridge asks these very fundamental questions. Are you positioned with leadership capabilities to get to where your vision says you wanna go? Do you have the leadership processes and behaviors in place to achieve better performance. And then the next slide gets into where most uh, consulting or uh, engagements end up focusing, which is, do you have the operational systems in place to solve a particular problem you have, whether it's contracting with suppliers to receive uh, timely delivery of the right materials to do your job, with uh, top-notch quality, or whether it's a revenue cycle that is seamless for your patients and customers, engaging with them, but yet also ensuring you deliver, you generate bills that are accurate and ensure your full compensation is achieved. So Baldrige then goes into the questions, and again, it's only questions. How do you design, manage, and improve your systems and processes? How do you design work to support the, uh, your workforce? And how do you engage the workforce in delivering better care and highly reliable care? And my last slide here just 
points out what we have found we need to do to leverage Baldrige for the best use. Um, and so in my experience, we see high reliability science very much uh, in use with many organizations who also use Baldrige. But the way we frame it is to suggest the, the green top bars could be the, the priority concerns of your board, the priority concerns of your CFO. How are we going to hire a, a, a stable workforce so we don't have to use travelers? How do we get better managed care rates? How do we improve clinical throughput in the organization so that our length of stay is on target? And for many, how do we ensure we achieve our high reliability goals and journey? But what we find is we weave those things then together with the Baldridge framework to ensure that the organization is looking to see, do we have the capabilities at this very fundamental level, the fundamental capabilities to achieve our goals uh, in all of our areas of priority. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for that description, Kate. Now I'm going to ask Ben Sawyer to join me and to co-facilitate this next segment here. And we're going to have a free-flowing discussion with Kate and Craig and ask you both to reflect on the organizations that you have worked with over the years and studied around the country. And to begin that conversation, what would you say is their attraction to the Baldrige framework? Are they also interested in high reliability? And would they use both together? What are your thoughts on that? Good, Kate, would you like to go first and then I'll, I'll follow you? Certainly. So I would say we see organizations attracted to Baldridge for two main reasons. One is the chaos of the varying methodologies that they've adopted over the last 20 to 30 years as they've tried to work in the space of performance improvement, quality improvement. They've got a lot, and then they've got the, the emerging surprises like coronavirus uh, or um, urgent care clinics showing up in their market and uh, stealing business from them. So they, they feel a need for structure and order to, to bring all their different approaches together and integrate them. The second uh, reason we find that they're attracted is because Everyone's under the pressure to make a financial margin, and but any leader in healthcare knows that that is the lagging indicator of what we do. The leading indicator is the safe, engaging, patient-centered care that we deliver, and they don't know how to balance those things, so they end up seeing them as either ors. Uh, and leaders are attracted to Baldridge because they see that potentially as a solution to the problems that they're facing in terms of tackling all the different problems that they have. The other thing I would say, and I'm really curious to hear your reaction, Craig, I see many organizations using both because they really are different. Baldrige is a diagnostic tool. It doesn't prescribe any particular cultural dynamics, behavioral expectations, improvement tools. High reliability science is a body of knowledge about the best ways to achieve what you want to achieve. So it's in essence a set of best practice leading science about the answers to the questions. So I see that what I find is when I see organizations using both, they're trying to marry the two methodologies. Yeah, yeah, Kate, that was um, very insightful and well said is, uh, I think the power of the Baldridge framework is that it's comprehensive is that uh, it gives you the ability to focus on both running the store and improving the store because it, it describes everything and if it, it left things out then that be that would be difficult to deal with i also agree um, with kate that i, I think in effect everybody uh, that does a uh, baldridge also does something around high reliability organizing and and some of the work might be modest and some of it might be substantial but I, I think they'll do both. Because if you if you think about uh, the HRO body of knowledge, especially as uh, defined by Wyke and Sutcliffe, it 
it doesn't say things like people have the knowledge and skill to do their jobs. And it doesn't say things like you have some defined work processes that actually function to serve the workforce. Because the presumption is that you've already attended to those through other means. So the HRO is like, well, what can raise you to another higher level of having like even fewer defects or better cost performance? What do you, what do you think of that, Kate? Or maybe I should refer back to Al. I said I wasn't going to try to guide the webinar. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so this is Ben Sawyer. There, there is a kind of a natural follow-up question, Kate and Craig, to that, and and that is how then can leaders use high reliability and Baldridge together to accomplish their goals? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Ben. Is I think uh, along the lines of you know attending to some basic reliability needs first, like knowledge and skills, and then having uh, defined processes, and then providing you know for technology and environment of care, and, and now you're ready to move past that very elementary point. Then I would think about having a structure that uh, shows the relationship to everything, you know, how we do care, how we improve care. And then I would think about as, as traits of leaders and as individuals, how can I weave that uh, safety science and high reliability organizing into that existing structure? That's my thought. Makes sense. Kate, do you have any thoughts on that question? Kind of worried that we lost Kate's audio. Yeah, I'm I sorry, we're... I was on mute. Oh, there we... uh, no, I'm fine. Yeah, okay. I, I really like Craig's answer. I guess I would say um, the only thing I would add to it is that one aspect of what we see when organizations adopt the Baldrige framework uh, and sort of embark on this grand journey although I, I i suspect you see this when folks get attracted to high reliability and decide they're going to embark on a, a very ambitious high reliability journey but the first thing we end up finding that we need to attend to is very basic stuff about what are the roles and responsibilities of senior executives who is the senior executive team how do they function together to integrate, align, and simplify the expectations that cascade from goals in the boardroom to the front line. And every organization struggles with that. They they tend, they, they don't have very basic leadership processes in place. And so we end up focusing in that very first Baldrige category in working to build a leadership system that's high performing so that then they can tackle this diversity of very complex challenges they face. So what would you say um, about organizations that have used both effectively? Do you have any clear examples um, of those types of organizations? Uh, I have I have one. I thought about uh, this question and recalled a very uh, very devoted Baldridge using organization that also used I believe they used HPI services as part of their high reliability journey, and that is Texas Health Resources in Dallas Fort Worth, uh, and and THR used Baldridge to integrate. Uh, two different systems to build a very large system. So they used it like a blueprint to put the system together and then to evaluate their basic foundational capabilities for leadership, strategy, customer listening, and so forth, all the elements of the categories of the Baldrige framework. Um, and they were also trying, they were also committed to high reliability and did a lot of work developing the skills. As their Baldrige journey shored, and they went all the way through uh, the Gold Tape Award at, to an, a national Baldrige site visit uh, before the first Ebola 
patient arrived at one of their hospital doors the week before that national site visit. I recall that uh, very sad story. Um, but they uh, they used their Baldridge category teams. Well, actually, let me back up. So what they did was they realized we need to update our behavioral standards based on uh, our high reliability knowledge that we now realize we're not we're not mature enough about applying in our expectations on behavior. And after they updated their behavioral standards, they then asked each of their Baldrige category teams to say, now how do we incorporate these behavioral standards that are built upon high reliability principles and body of knowledge to update and improve all of our key systems and processes that you all are managing? Uh, and they did that quite effectively. So that that's the, the main story I could tell, but I, I am confident that many organizations, especially those that are capable of improvement and really capable of taking a methodology and getting great results, they look at high reliability and they look at Baldrige because they're the kind of people who say, we're going to go places with um, and improve, do something significantly better than what we've done in the past. Yeah, and this is Craig. I'd, I'd like to add uh, Sharp Healthcare in San Diego. Is it Sharp yeah. uh, this is Baldrige Framework. They're also uh, one of the few Baldrige Award winners. And they use uh, high reliability organizing for all seven of their outcome areas for the safety, the quality, the patient experience, uh, the engagement of the team, the financial performance, the growth in the community. And I think from our similar, our previous themes is that um, given the comprehensiveness of the framework, it becomes uh, easy to infuse a high reliability principle at the right spot. And that's why I admired uh, Kate's uh, scaffold analogy. That's a great image that it provides a scaffolding so you can hang other evidence-based solutions on it. In, in fact, I think the, the power triangle would be Baldridge framework with lean for improvement and HRO for performance culture. I think that'd be a very powerful triangle. That's very helpful. So uh, the follow-up question to kind of look at it through a different lens, there's, there's, this is kind of a three-part question, so I'll, I'll give all three questions and then maybe go back to each one. When have you collectively seen either or both methodologies fail? So that's question one. And then what are the characteristics of efforts to use these approaches that you have seen falter? And then the third question is, what are the pitfalls that you would encourage our listeners to avoid? Well, that's a great question. Do you want to take it first, Craig, or do you want me to? Uh, no, I'd, I'd like to follow you, Kate. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've seen, uh, well, we should probably just define fail. Um, I've seen many uh, uh, efforts to use both Baldridge and HRO, high reliability principles and body of knowledge, fall short of what we would hope. I think, that, in fact, we know from the business literature that most transformational change efforts or initiatives, most of them fail. So, not surprisingly, if you if you look at the history of the the business literature about you know good to great organizations and all the books and all the articles written about how do you find that secret sauce to make any methodology work, it's difficult. Um, I guess I would say a couple of things about why do they fail and what pitfalls should we try to avoid. The first thing uh, in my experience that if you can't get over this hurdle, it's, you're, it's time to look for a, a different employer and a different organization. If you yourself as an individual is committed to being a part of some very special organization. If senior leadership delegates the responsibility to make the change, whether it's implementing high reliability or it's leading a Baldrige journey, if they put that too far away from their own accountability, if they don't put the energy into learning 
themselves, if they're not willing to ask the question, what do I personally need to do to change? Uh, when you're in a situation like that, it's, it's, a, it's almost certain. It, it is certain in my experience, it will fail. There may be some gains on the margins, but you, you usually run into the situation where there's a blip and improvement and whatever you're trying to do, but it, re, it reverts to the baseline fairly quickly. Um, the other thing I would say is that anytime an organization adopts new tools, tactics, techniques, if they silo them and even, you know, if, if they get siloed and lined up in separate camps and nobody's attending to how do we integrate all these things? How do we ensure they all work together? How do we look holistically at the enterprise across the horizontal, not down the org chart, but across the horizontal as our customers experience it? Chances are you are in fact gonna um, have very little return for the investment. And then I guess the, the last thing I would say, and this is one of the things that made me so so happy to join Guidehouse is, you know, when Navigant became part of Guidehouse, which is a Boulder recipient, because lo and behold, this this consulting firm that works with military medicine and the VA and is heavily into technology, innovation, uh, deep and wide, uh, in, in they knew enough to create a change management model. And they knew enough to say, we have to, to incorporate state-of-the-art change management at the front end of everything we do. And I firmly believe, I watch our organizations start one of these approaches, and then sure enough, they're not getting the results. And then I have to figure out how to try to help them manage change better so they can get the results. Uh, whereas if you really incorporate change management principles and how you lead a journey, whatever that journey is named, uh, it's it's really an essential element um, given how much our people are, are dealing with and how stressful their jobs are. Yeah, okay, this is Craig. I, I, I like the, the points, especially with the, the executives owning it as, as theirs. And then the siloing effect, which I see that as well, where they say like, well, I'm going to use the Baldrige framework, but that's only for quality. Is I'm going to do my patient experience another way and I'll have my safety a third way and I'll partner with somebody around workforce solutions, maybe even a separate way. Right now we have mm -hmm. a, a subculture for every outcome and we complain about how much work it is as leaders. I think one place to start would be to have you know, one structure, one performance culture that does everything that we want. The safety, the quality, the experience, the yeah. engagement, the efficiency and the improvement. Maybe Ben to transition to the, the second of the related questions on like, well, how do you get past that? I'd, I'd learned from uh, Tim Pearson, when we worked for Tim Pearson at Intermountain, he was a regional executive we also work with him at Integris uh, in Oklahoma as the uh, system chief executive. And, and Tim pointed out to me that, uh, you know, too often we try to do something modest and have like a simple approach. And that enables leaders then to engage in this new idea as a hobby and still do their job the old way. So now you've created like two, two different uh, leadership systems. Tim's thinking, and I've, I've grown to agree, is that you have to make the leadership system, the operating system, the entire work system comprehensive enough that it crowds out that old thinking. And then they have no choice but to do their daily work through it and do their improvement work through it. Right, that makes good sense. I'm afraid I don't remember the third part of the question, so I'm hopeful that Kate will just jump in and answer it. Oh. Well, actually, Kate, I think you I think you did uh, answer all three. That was impressive. Um, Al, I think uh, you have kind of a closing summary question, correct? We may have lost him. We may have lost him, so I'm going to go ahead and ask. No, we didn't. Question. I'm here. Oh, go ahead. 
The okay, other, I, was, I did the same thing Kate did. I was on mute. Um, in closing, uh, I'd like to hear a summary from both of you on how you would advise someone to try to effectively leverage both of the methodologies. Yeah, Kate, if I go first, then you can get the all-powerful last word on the topic. <laughs> I don't know. I may just say, yeah, Briggs, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I well, I guess it's possible, but low low probability. So uh, this this is my thought on on that very large and important topic. Is I think the the best way to get started is to uh, have a, a comprehensive framework that can do an inventory of your strengths and weaknesses. The uh, biggest sin in performance improvement is to give up on something that is adding value for your team and your community in an effort to stimulate progress in another area. So make sure you inventory those strengths and those weaknesses, jealously hang on to those strengths, and then start talking about um, how can I, in a systematic way, start to uh, lead improvement, lead operations, and then uh, lead practice habits of, of care? I, th I think having a, a system that helps leaders to do their work is the, the biggest advantage that we have right now in, in healthcare. Historically, we allowed leaders to kind of do what they wanted or what they were trained to do. But I think having a leadership system where we all do it together. And, you know, Kate, there's a lot of talk about uh, magnet journey in nursing. I think most of our listeners would be familiar with magnet journeys. Is that uh, as a nuclear engineer, uh, magnetism comes from the subatomic particles, which are each one magnetic in themselves. And the reason we don't notice it is they mostly cancel each other out. But uh, iron has one unpaired uh, electron that if they all get spinning in the same direction is then the entire um, piece of metal can act as a magnet. And, and that's the key is getting everybody to spin in the same direction. And uh, the idea of canceling out, think of that as the other service line director that's always canceling out your good ideas. So I, I think that's really the power of things like Baldridge and high reliability uh, principles and, and lean is they kind of get us all spinning and going in the same direction and we don't cancel each other out and we're very powerful. And then my, my last thing, Kate, so you should be warming up, is I, I really believe in that power triangle is having something that's very comprehensive, like Baldridge, having something that is uh, very proven and simple to use like lean and then having those principles of high reliability organizations to be hang on that scaffolding that, that Kate had described. Thanks. Well, that's, that's great. Um, and I, I can't compete with any physics analogies. It's been a while since I took physics, so I, but I really appreciate the idea and the concept and, and definitely love the notion of getting things spinning in the same direction. Um, I guess I would, and I, I, I'd love if we have time, we may have lots of questions, but if uh, Craig, you have a reaction to this, I'd be eager to hear it. Um, I've uh, noticed uh, two things about successful users of any of these bodies of knowledge. I mean, I've been working in healthcare for 30 plus years now, and I've seen lots of organizations try to improve, and as we talked earlier, not succeed. One trait that I haven't researched this quantitatively as a scientist, uh, beyond the book that I and my team wrote now 10 years ago, is where we studied the first nine Baldridge uh, award recipients to see what what was common to each of them and their success. And one trait I noticed among them and as I've studied exemplars over the years since is they very much tend to internalize external sources of best practice and leading edge practice. And what do I mean by that? Sort of an abstract comment. I'll give you an example. 
Hooter Valley Health System, which was a recipient, what it's now been eight, 10 years ago, they used very few consultants. They adopt, when they would go to conferences or read books or watch other organizations, they would, what they called, pooterize the concepts, the language, and they, they marketed internally everything as their own. So they would customize what they were learning and integrate it into the Pooter Valley way. Um, that wasn't the name of it, but they were very good at that. And we saw this with many of the early organizations. I think there's a real power to that where it's not branded as the external source. It's branded in your own way. It's integrated into your own language. I see many organizations finding great value in studying lean, but you, you take start talking in Japanese to clinicians and they're not they're not good with those words so we'll rename it name it something they are comfortable with so that notion of customizing and internalizing and then working to fit it all together in a simple narrative that works I think is a distinguishing factor and the second thing I would say which is something Craig said earlier and I'll just reiterate it I do believe in real power in uh, big aspirations. We're not just trying to get a little bit better, but when the C team is really trying to fundamentally change uh, and to, to, to set the aspirations high, it's important for, for one key reason. Our workforces don't get out of bed in the middle of the night and go slog through the work that they have to do in our hospitals and, and clinics to be mediocre. They they want to be part of something that's really aspirational. So you've got to find that sweet spot of engaging them around the aspirations, but then you've got to do all the work of building all the systems and processes to make it easy for them to do the right thing. Then I think you've got the right balance. Yeah, yeah Kate, I think you were right on on both. Is uh, you have to have your name on it and say, this is our way of caring. This is our way of leading. This is our way of improving and, and not get caught up in a lot of brand names. And, and the second part is, I, I think whenever we have modest goals, everybody thinks, well, let's just do the same thing and try just a little harder, hope to get lucky. So I think we do a lot better when we say things like zero harm or we should have 100% uh, appropriate care, or we should be the best place to receive care or the best place to practice medicine. Those, those things all work better. We do have a couple quick comments from the audience and, and the questions here. And Craig, I'm gonna give you the first one. It sounds like this one's for you. Um, can you explain what a socio-techno system is and, and its uh, applicability here? Oh, excellent. Yeah, a socio-technical system. It's a work system that has people and then process and technology all mixed together. So literally every work system that you could name is a socio-technical system. I'd used it today to kind of open up to our listeners that there's, you know, some good research and, and writing out there and then they can search on that phrase. Thanks. And Kate, I'm going to give you this one here. What do you think the advantages are for Baldrige organizations when it comes to emergency management, disaster readiness, and crisis response? That's a wonderful and obviously very timely question. Um, I, I would say two things. One is, depending on how far along in your Baldrige work you are, you have invested in fundamental processes uh, documenting, hardwiring, improving fundamental processes throughout your core work of patient care and your support systems that support that work, um, as well as your leadership system, the, the processes that, that guide the work. Um, so you, if you're far enough along that you've paid attention to building those, you then have the agility to turn and apply the the principles of, of process design, process ownership, process improvement, process measurement, 
uh, and you know, we we in theory are well prepared in advance. Obviously, I, as I'm watching our organizations prepare for Corona, they're having to do things that they haven't had to do for a while, and they haven't had to do it at this magnitude. But the more use is Baldridge organizations grow process literate. So if you've grown process literate, you understand there are key processes, basic steps, need to have a certain degree of documentation of them, we need to evaluate and improve them periodically, and you've grown process literate. When you then turn to say, how are we going to prepare for this pandemic? How are we going to divide the work, organize the work? What are the key processes that need to be adapted to prepare? And you list those key processes. If you've grown process literate, however far along in Baldridge, uh, your Baldridge journey you are, then you are ready to step back and say, whoa, this is not just your basic disaster. Um, we need to apply those principles quickly and effectively to be ready. Thanks so much, Kate. And thanks to both of you, both Craig and Kate, for this outstanding section of our webinar uh, for this quarter. Um, we learned a great deal and, and two great presentations, and you answered a lot of tough questions, but uh, I know that I personally feel uh, far more informed about both of the frameworks now than I did prior to. So thanks again for all that you do out there. Excellent. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Look forward to seeing everyone again soon. We, um, we're now going to have a couple of updates from the Foundation and the Program and the Alliance for Performance Excellence. Uh, first, I would like to tell everybody thank you for all that you do out there with Baldridge and all the stellar results that you produce and the sharing of best practices. Telling your story in Congress is what continues to keep the Baldridge program funded year in and year out. Uh, we are working on the 21 budget right now, and all the indications are is that we will have bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate Commerce, Justice, Science subcommittees uh, for the Baldrige appropriation of $2.2 million. So again, thank you for all you do as a part of that effort. We continue to work with the administration on the recognition of award recipients. Obviously, uh, COVID-19 is going to put a dent in that for this year, and Bob is going to talk a little bit later in his presentation about the plans moving forward. But I do want to tell you about an exciting new development that will be uh, rolled out tomorrow by the SOAR Vision Group, one of our strategic partners here at the Foundation, and that is a COVID-19 Pulse platform, which is their automated system of helping to manage information within hospitals and hospital systems and clinics. And this particular one will help org organizations throughout healthcare uh, manage CDC guidelines and recommendations. So we're very excited to be rolling that out tomorrow uh, about midday. I'd like to thank our newest member of the Mac Baldridge Society, which are the 20 founding trustees of the Institute for Performance Excellence and Stellar Solutions from uh, California. Thank you again for your support and then all that you do uh, with Baldrige throughout the country. On the Institute for Performance Excellence side, I would like to remind everybody that our call for papers for our newest publication, which will be released this fall, The Chronicle of Leadership and Management, which will be a peer-reviewed academic journal. And so we are going to try to get this out in uh, academic institutions, colleges and universities throughout the country, uh, as well as all other organizations, and then have it available on our website as well. If you're interested, please go to our website, take a look at the call for papers, uh, download the guidelines, and consider making a submission. Uh, our editor-in-chief is Dr. Jim Evans, the former uh, dean of the College of Business at the University of Cincinnati and the former editor, senior editor for ASQ's Quality Press. I'd like to thank real quick Kay Kendall. Kay was our most recent guest on the Foundation's radio show, which you can listen to uh, every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and we have two links down there on how you can connect to it. If you miss one, that's okay because they're also podcasts and you can download them and listen to them at your convenience. 
So with that, again, thank you for uh, everything that you do in support of the foundation here. And I'll turn it over to Bob Fangmeyer, the director of the Baldrige Program. Bob? Thanks, Al. And before I get started on the update, Kate and Craig, thank you both very much for your presentations uh, and the dialogue around that. Um, it was it was wonderful, and I, I really appreciate uh, the information and your insights on the complementary nature of the Baldrige framework, high reliability, lean, et cetera. That is still one of the most important messages that we need to continue to try and get out there. So thank you very much. Okay, so um, if you'll, uh, Al, if you'd go to the next slide, and if everybody else, if you'll forgive me, uh, I'm going to reorganize these talking points a bit because some of you probably already saw, but last night we released an announcement, a critical announcement, canceling this year's award ceremony and Quest conference, which was scheduled for two weeks from now. And uh, as I'm sure all of you are also doing, we've been paying very close attention to this continually evolving coronavirus situation. And we recognize the potential disruption this could cause our events and activities as far back as early February. So. We began contingency planning and we began dialoguing with NIST. And, and around in mid-February, uh, we started making real headway with NIST and some of that planning. On March 2nd, I provided an in-depth briefing for the Baldridge staff and really got everyone on course for how we were going to address this issue. So at the same time, we were in regular dialogue with our award recipients and we were hearing from other members of the Baldridge community and of course many many people are very concerned and we were seeing many organizations canceling travel many individuals expressing concerns and we began losing speakers and presenters and attendees etc all of that on top of the uh, need for us to make sure that we are doing everything we should to protect our community and yours uh, led to the decision to cancel both events. We also had to go through both NIST and DOC to get that decision and any messaging vetted. So that took a little time, but we did get the message out last night. So what I can currently share with you is, as I said, we are postponing the award ceremony and quest until next year's ceremony and quest. And we did that in uh, complete um, uh, agreement with uh, all six of our current award recipients. They fully supported that, that particular move. We're also going to be canceling our on-site examiner training in Gaithersburg. Our plan is to convert the curriculum to a virtual training model and include online modules, webcasts, and independent study. There are a few more near-term activities that are under discussion, uh, including the Baldrige Executive Fellows Program, the June Judges Meeting, and the June Overseers Meeting all of which may well be impacted and may see some changes. So I wanted to make that announcement in case you hadn't seen it or heard it. Um, if you have questions around any of those things, please, you can reach out to me directly. Um, if we don't have time for questions at the end here uh, or um, send us an email. So real quick, a few other updates. Operationally, uh, today we are notifying our examiners of their selection. And of course, we had to modify that information to adjust it for not having any uh, on-site uh, sessions. Um, we've carefully thought out a plan for how we're going to convert examiner training into a virtual model, and we are already beginning uh, that process. Of course, there is a bit to do still for closing out ceremony and quest, including addressing a significant number of contracts that must be canceled. But one good piece of news, the award recipients will still get their crystal trophies on schedule. Uh, I know many of them had plans for how they were going to celebrate um, when they received the crystal, and those plans will still be able to be uh, held. Okay, strategically, uh, we continue to push forward with the award process redesign implementation. For anyone who's been on these calls before, or perhaps you've been an examiner, a judge, an overseer, or a foundation board member in recent years, you've heard me talk about the changes that will go live in 2021. So I'm not going to repeat any of the details here. But you should know that um, in the meantime, as we, arrive, as we get to 2021, we are running this year's award process under the current approach, while also updating all of the various processes, systems, materials, 
for the new process so that when we go live, we'll be ready and it'll be a smooth transition. Finally, we also continue our work with the cross agency task group that is creating a new presidential award for organizations that have demonstrated excellence in their workforce education, training, and retraining efforts. This is in response to two executive orders and it's under the direction of the National Council for the American Worker, which is co-chaired by Ivanka Trump, Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross, and Secretary of Labor Eugene Scalia. Recently, the National Council decided that awardees for this recognition should come from the pool of organizations that have signed the Pledge to America's Workers. And in doing so, they also suggested a name, the Pledge to America's Workers Presidential Award. Although it's our intention not to use the acronym, you'll notice that that acronym for the award would be PAPA. And if you add a W when talking about the winners, the Pledge to America's Workers Presidential Award winner, they are now PAWPAW. -paw. Unfortunately, they did not take my suggestion to change it to something else, almost anything else. Anyway, we hope to leverage this initiative to introduce a whole new audience to Baldrige concepts and principles and create awareness of and interest in Baldrige tools and resources including the Alliance programs. And with that, I will stop and I will turn it over to Brian who will update you on the Alliance programs. Very good, thanks, Bob. Can you all hear me? Can somebody confirm my audio is yes. having problems too? We can hear you well, Brian. Very good, thanks. Hello everybody and I too thank Kate and, and Craig. What a great uh, conversation earlier. Thanks for hosting that out. I'll, I'll be very brief, we only have a couple of minutes. I'll just take one of them and see if there's any questions for any of us. Um, We'll go to slide 29. I did want to share some of the updated statistics on the Alliance. For those of you on the call that are not familiar, we consider ourselves the gateway, the feeder system to all the rest of Baldur's Enterprise. We're the state, regional, local, and sector-based, Baldur's based programs across the nation. And uh, you see some of the statistics uh, listed on the page. Uh, we show some growth in 2019. We got our final numbers in a couple of weeks ago. Um, and have tabulated almost 1,600 applications across the 29 programs, which is up significantly from 1241 last year, but 250 or so additional applicants at a variety of levels. 181 full 50-page applications, which is the full narrative and uh, similar to the national program's input, and that's up from 158, so nice growth there as well. Um, trained almost 1,700 examiners in the last year, um, hundred, I'm sorry, a little over a thousand recipients at all levels, which is up from 826. 24 of them are top level of recipients, which is pretty much the same as last year. The Alliance and our member programs have hosted 21 different conferences across the nation, with over 3,000 total attendees. Uh, and just in case you're wondering, collectively, we represent 37 paid staff, which is up three from uh, the previous year. So a little bit of hiring going on throughout the Alliance and 721 volunteers in addition to uh, the 1,700 examiners I mentioned earlier. So quite the uh, vast network of professionals and volunteers trying to advance these concepts of excellence across the nation. Uh, I won't get into a lot of the updates on the committee work on the next slide. I will mention that the Baldrige Fall Conference is still set for October 21 and 22 in Milwaukee. Uh, we no doubt will start contingency planning too and exploring alternatives depending on the status of the virus six months from now. Uh, but we're excited about that. Planning's already underway. The program's nearly set, and, and that should be a, a great learning and networking event, as always. And we continue to uh, manage our own task forces and some enterprise task forces in, in partnership with the program and the foundation. So I'll stop there. I think we only have about a minute left, Al, so we'll see if there's any questions or wrap up. Yes, I just wanted to remind everybody uh, real quick that our uh, slides as well as the recorded webinar will be available on our website starting tomorrow. And to thank all of our sponsors who continue to support not only the foundation, but the program and the enterprise as a whole. So thank you everybody for tuning in. Our next webinar will be June 25th, 2020. Have a great evening.